So you, with the benefit of the mic, you're also going to be able to hear me, um, all my mutterings and uh, clearing my throat and the occasional cough. I've, I've come down with uh, patient zero as my costume today. Uh, completely benign, looks like you know head of the class, uh, but I'm deathly ill. Um, so you have to pardon me as I you know take several drinks of water as we go along. Um, so to get to get started, uh, you guys have me outnumbered. So I was gonna see if you guys would tell me a little bit about yourselves. Like who here is interested in someday starting a company? All right, great. Um, out of the people here, how many of you are actively working on something? All right. Out of those that are actively working on something, how many of you actually have customers? Awesome, awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your company? Great. Between the two of you, you guys are gonna be able to correct me on a lot of things that I say. So I appreciate your feedback. And, and as we go along, you know, I would appreciate it as we, you know, if you have questions, you wanna call me out, let me know. Um, what I'm gonna talk through is not a, an edict or a, I'm, I'm not a professor, I, I don't have a hard science to back this up. I'm just sharing my experience and kind of what I've observed over, over my career. Um, so being on my career, don't throw anything at me because of the first thing up there. I know you don't usually see those letters blazoned up here. Um, but I, I, I'm originally from Oklahoma. I went to this uh, school called the University of Oklahoma. <clears throat> and I, I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering there. And I never practiced because I wasn't that good at it. Uh, but I, I ended up going to work for a startup. And I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. It was, it was horrible. But I learned a lot in the, the three years I was there. And uh, while I was there, I... I, I I couldn't figure out what was going on, and so I decided I was gonna go get an MBA so I could learn this, how to talk like these business people and figure out what, what, what are we doing? You know, why are we making these decisions? So uh, I, I suckered the people at, at UT to let me in. My name's Matt Thomas, a pretty common name. Uh, so I think some other guy got, got bumped, but they let me in. And uh, that was a really great experience. And along the way, I also got a PhD in mixology from, from Harvard University. Uh, Anybody familiar with the science of mixology? No? So uh, mixology is the science of learning how to be a bartender. So uh, um, my mom always wanted a doctor and wanted me to go to Harvard, and this is how she got it. <coughs> so uh, resume-wise, if you guys want to know the details, I'll, I'm happy to talk about it. The first part's kind of boring. Um, the, the more interesting part is the last two up there. So uh, at, while I was at, at, here at McCombs, I met a professor uh, by the name of Jack Long. He had founded a company called Lone Star and I was working on another one called People Admin. And uh, I got snookered into taking a class he was giving and I had no interest in entrepreneurship. I, um, I, I thought all entrepreneurs were wild and crazy. Uh, they start things in their dorm rooms, they go to Vegas every minute that they can, they're constantly betting, and I'm just not wired that way. And I took this class from Jack and he's just kind of this, this really nice guy, good old boy from, from Tennessee. Um, and, and taking that class really changed my perspective. Like I, I, I really related to him, and uh, that completely changed my direction. So I, you know, I want to work for sorry, I want to work for Jack. I want to learn what Jack knows. And then, fortunately, through that class, I met his business partner, Jeff Carpenter, and uh, they uh, subsequently, after getting out of McCombs, they ended up hiring me. So I, I started off as an imp, uh, an implementer, software implementer at their 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 company, which we did HR software. Uh, it's still, the company still exists, actually. Uh, HR software for uh, colleges, universities, and um, municipalities. So, like City of Austin, if you apply for a job, you're actually using their software, which I implemented forever ago. Um, but went to work for those guys, and I, I learned a lot, and uh, went through a couple acquisitions, and then um, things kind of changed, and that was the kick in the pants I needed to go start my own thing, which was called Academic Works. And, we did scholarship management software for colleges and universities. Basically, what that means is, and, and community foundations. So we help make sure that not only are the scholarships easy to find um, and easier for the students to apply for, but you don't even necessarily have to apply. You could just applying, by virtue of applying to, say, uh, Auburn University, behind the scenes, we would go and match you with all the scholarships that, that you would be qualified for. And magically, you get an email or a letter saying, congratulations, you got money, as opposed to you having to go and find all those. Um, and worked on that for about uh, seven years. We started in, in, in 2010 and then uh, sold to a company called Blackpod in uh, 2017, so just a little over a year and a half ago. 
A um, couple things I'm currently working on. Uh, there's a company, uh, actually another UT alum, uh, Earthly Labs. We're working on capturing CO2 from breweries from the fermentation process and then cleaning it up, liquefying it, and putting it back in the beer. Uh, and uh, I help out with the Herb Keller Center, the Entrepreneur in Residence program, which if there's a lot of other great entrepreneurs in residence. And uh, there's a woman, uh, Catherine Turpin, that actually does the legal side of things. So if you're interested in you know, getting some help on the legal side, it's a really great resource. And uh, we're all here to help you guys out. Um, I'm typically here on Thursdays, but feel free to reach out to me otherwise if that doesn't work for you. And then I'm involved with a, a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization. It's a worldwide organization for um, founders of companies that have done a million dollars in revenue or more. And um, that, that organization has really helped me out quite a bit over my journey. So diving into the meat of things, um, what do you guys think product market fit is? Is there a need or desire for your product or service? I like that. I like that approach of actually going through and putting it as a question as opposed to a statement. So there's a smart guy. He, uh, he said his product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. So this is the guy that actually coined the phrase, supposedly. I'm going to believe it. But the thing, I, I kind of think it's kind of self-evident. And it doesn't really, for me, it doesn't give, delineate a mark. You know, it, it doesn't feel like, okay, yes, I've achieved. If I, I test myself against this definition, is that an easy thing to do? So that part doesn't really, I have some trouble with that. I get it, but it's hard for me to put a stake in the ground. Another really smart guy, I think he was an engineer. Identifying a compelling value hypothesis is what I call finding product market fit. A value hypothesis addresses both the features and the business model required to entice a customer to buy your product. A little wordy, but it kind of expands the definition. The, the, and I, I like it, but I still kind of feel like I have this kind of definition. I know it when I see it. And now, this guy was talking about something different, but it kind of feels that way. And there's some people actually will, you know, that's, when do you know you have product market fit? Oh, you'll know it. Like, you're in the groove, you feel it, you know, things are happening. But the, the definition that kind of resonates with me is product market fit is when people sell for you. And what I like about this is that it's both an inflection point it's not necessarily a hard delineation line in the sand, but it's definitely an inflection point that you can feel. But it's also not time bound. It's not discrete in that it just happens and then you have it. That's, this actually implies that you can lose it. So product market fit, for me, is you're working to build a company, you're working to work on an idea to try to get to a point to where people are actually selling and this, you start getting this, this the flywheel type of motion. This starts to continue. But it doesn't mean that that can just, you get it and you're like, all right, hands off, and just, we collect checks. Let's just get the money. You can lose it. Somebody like us, there were four competitors in our market, comes up and steals your candy if you just lay back on it. So that's, this definition for me is the one that tends to work best because, I, again, I like the fact that it is um, not necessarily this time bound, and it kind of implies that it is something that you can lose. So how do we find product market fit? This is what, in my experience, a lot of people, when I hear them kind of talk through what they're doing, this is kind of the steps they, they go through. And they, they work on a product, and this is in particular in the day and age we're in now, where you know, software is ubiquitous and everybody's learning how to code, and people develop these really great skills, which is really powerful. Um, they have this idea of, here's this, here's this thing I'm going to build, here's a solution, and, and I'm going to make it, and then I'm going to show it to the world, and raise some money, and then we'll go find some customers, and if it doesn't work, we'll pivot. We'll pivot market, pivot product, pivot, pivot. And, and this can work, but it kind of looks like this. Right? You've built a really nice hammer that's looking for a nail. And, and this, this does work. Um, there's a company called Weebly that sold not too long ago. And those guys, the, they spent the first 18 months before they got to product market fit. That's a long walk through a desert to make sure you find it. It's spending a lot of money, too. Guys at Instagram, they did all right. Sold for a billion dollars. Spent a year on an app called Bourbon. Put it out there, pulled it back, started over again. Spent you know, several months after that. And by the way, once they put the app out, they raised $500,000, so they had a little more runway to go. They spent over a year, probably a year, 18 months, coming up with now Instagram. And, and it can work, and, it, and, it's, and I'm not saying you shouldn't go and experiment. Um, but I think there's a, a different approach that can actually save time, money, save equity for you uh, if you're a founder um, that's a little bit different than this. So I suggest that we focus on market product fit. 
minds are blown, right? Wow, you just switched those words and changed my mind. <laughs> drop, drop the presentation, we're done. This is it, this is it. So the idea here is that I think with a lot of product market fit, we're focusing on the product part and not the market. We're gonna build a product and then we're gonna find the market that it fits in, as opposed to coming up with a thesis, coming up with an idea, and then going through and seeing if this actually works in a market. And then pivoting if that market doesn't work before we actually write a line of code, before we build a product. And the validation process for this, I, I kind of think of it in four steps. Ideation, then moving on to market fundamentals, which is basically kind of the economist view. You know, how big is the market? Where, you know, who, how is it segmented and so on. Then customer development, this is my favorite part. This is where I would recommend spending most of our time. And then once we have that, if we're still excited about this opportunity, then we go through into product development. And the real way, I think, that to look at this is like how to fall in love with the problem. And if we do this right, what we see is when we have an idea, I kind of think of like this iceberg. We see this thing kind of floating on the surface of the water. And we have this, you know, we've had some experience, professional otherwise, we have this idea that we start digging into it, we start looking at the market, we start talking to customers and asking about it, and we find that, whoa, there's so much more under the surface. So for our academic works, we started with, man, applying for scholarships sucks. There's gotta be a better way. Like, I've been out of college for a while, and it's the same way as it was back then. They've just taken paper and put it up on the web. And it's not any better. They just synthesized a bad process and, and made it more efficient by virtue of the fact that you put a WWW in front of it. But as we started calling, we started finding more, like, this is a really, really hard problem. And there's actually a lot of other aspects to it. It's not just the initial scholarship, it's renewing scholarships are a really big problem. Those are the ones that you get for years two, three, and four. They're having to track you in a spreadsheet. Did you get an internship? Is your mom or dad sick? You know, there's reasons you've left. Have you reapplied? So, you know, as we go through, we get really excited about the problem. Not this idea of like, I'm gonna, look at my hammer. Look how nice it is, shiny, nice wood, you know. It's going through and like, wow, this, look at how, how deep this problem goes. I can actually, not only you know, is this, this initial idea I had about the, the product you know, or a potential solution valid, but there's so much more. I can build it in all these different ways. There's different product offerings, but ways to upsell and so on uh, as you're going along. And this is opposed to you know, kind of the alternative, which maybe you're looking at an idea, you see it floating on top, but as you dig in, it's really more like an ice cube, not like an iceberg. There's not that much below the surface. And that may not be the right opportunity for us. So kind of stepping through um, you know, these, th this kind of framework, if you will, the ideation part is pretty easy, but there's a couple things I want to point out. Taking a step back and reflecting on yourself, like where, did you, where does this idea come from? What's the origin of it? Is it from, you know, what, where's, where is your domain knowledge coming from? Is it from your professional experience? So in my case, uh, I had worked in uh, higher ed on the HR side and had this idea about application processing and thought, hey, this could maybe, you know, is there a way to apply this somewhere else? Or how are, you know, there's similar problems in the higher ed market. Um, is this an experience that you've had as a consumer? I, as a student applying for scholarships, had that experience. And then one little note about large, uh, the, the law of, of large numbers is that I, I, there's a lot of problems out there and, and, and academic solved, work solved one of these that don't necessarily apply to that. that Here's a $10 billion market if we only capture 1% of this, that's a lot of money for everybody in this room who wants to write me a check, right? Well, how is that market segmented? How do they behave? There's all these questions going down into it. If you look at our market, and I'll get into this a little bit later, you would you'd probably all turn your head nose up if I was pitching you my idea back in 2010. But if we get into the material of it, we start doing the research, then you see there's actually a really op a good opportunity there. So market fundamentals. Again, this is kind of looking at the overall macro aspect. And this is also referred to as secondary market research. This is stuff you, and you guys especially that are part of the campus community have access to resources that other people have to pay for. But be able to look up, you know, what, what are the aspects of this market that um, are attract, may be attractive or may not be? You know, how fast is it growing? How big is it? What is the different ways it gets segmented? So for instance, in higher education, is it just colleges and universities? For your publics, for your privates, to your colleges is actually another arm. It's the foundations that are uh, uh, tied to those entities. And if we dig down even further, which comes up in the customer side of things, you have uh, affinity groups. So colleges of the Fenway, Simmons, and Mass College of Art 
actually look to each other as peers, even though you would think they're completely different types of institutions. Santa Clara College in California doesn't look at UC Berkeley. They want to know if you've signed up St. Louis or DePaul because they're looking at other Jesuit institutions. And then looking at who the competition is. How are they performing? Are they doing well? Do they have a stagnant product? Are they up and coming? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information you can find there that's in the, you know, is available to you via Google, uh, via LexisNexis, many other different uh, sources. That's a good question. And the way I would look at that is that I don't think we can apply just to, this, to the market itself. It also, it also, you have to tie that back into like, how much are you gonna be able to get for your product, right? So in, in our case, you look at, there are 4,000 institutions of higher education in the US. If you filter that, that's from the IPEDS government report. Uh, if you filter that down, that goes from everything from the largest institutions, Ohio State, University of Central Florida, all the way down to a beauty college with one person in it. So those 4,000, that's not our entire market. There's about 2,200 of them that could be of the size that we felt that could benefit from our product. And then we'd, as we filter that down, we look at, okay, what's that floor? They have to have $100,000 in their foundation, we think, to give away $100,000 a year. And what could we charge for that? And if we back that in, uh, in kind of just back of the envelope calculations, we found that in our case, we need to get an average of $15,000 a year to make this opportunity interesting for us, to build the company that we wanted to build. Now, somebody else, and there are other people out there that have done it for a lot less, $5,000. But that guy, he's relatively small, doesn't work with the larger institutions, he's on the lower end of the market. So it's, I don't think it's necessarily an absolute, but if you're looking to, you're, I want to build a $100 million company, we need to have a market that can, can support that. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, you know, a couple quick notes on research. And um, on the, one thing I want to point out is on the, uh, the, the, the bottom side here, um, Google, there's a lot of really good Google being what have you, uh, search tricks where you can really get an idea of your competition. So there's a company called AHA that does product management software. If you're interested in who their customers are, if you do that site, colon, aha.io, you'll start to get all the top level domains of their customers. Um, it can be, you can do it manually. There's smarter people who can write scripts to do that. Um, if you want to see any academic works contracts, we can search for academic works contract site.edu. It'll restrict the search down to just domains ending in .edu, which means colleges and universities. So it, this is a great trick, especially for us. We use that a lot to be able to find um, what our competitors are doing or find contracts and additional information. So now we get into customer discovery, and this is the really fun part. This is where I suggest, um, this is where we spent most of our time. And I, I could do 60 slides just on on this, the, the questions we're trying to answer. But this is the part where it gets really hard, especially for my uh, programming fan, friends, is that this is where we have to talk to people, human beings. And that doesn't mean a survey. It means a phone, and I hate talking on the phone. I, and I can't tell you how many phone calls I've done. I've gotten good at it now, but I hate it. still hate it. But I do it, and I get excited because I get excited about the, the opportunity, the problem. Talking to people face to face. That's where the real magic happens because now we've gone through and we said, hey, we have this idea. Looks like this is a market that can support this idea. Now let's go talk to people in that market and figure out what that problem is and do the, how do they see the problem. And, are there, and as we talk to them, are there pieces, are there threads that come off of that that there's ways to really expand upon? Is, or is this just some discrete thing that nobody really cares about? And you know, there's some key things we want to find out. Is like, who is the actual customer? So there's the person who's paying you so in our case, it's financial aid, typically. But sometimes financial aid pairs up with donor relations, who goes through and manages the donors, or advancement, who's going through and raising the money. But there's also the donors themselves. There's the students. There's the reviewers, who could be members of the campus community, or could be donors, or could be somebody else completely outside of that. So understanding who all those players are, and how they interact, and how they influence the person who's making the buying decision all comes through that. And and what happens through this process of going through and really just doing this kind of this customer discovery is figuring out not only is there an opportunity here, but what is that business process? And as we practice going through and having these calls, that actually develops into um, what becomes a bit of a pitch. That becomes our sales and marketing process as well. And if we get past that point, we're ready to go and pull the trigger on this opportunity. Now we move into actually doing something. This is where we start coding or building the thing. 
And this is, we've now able to focus all that information we've gathered and actually focus it in a, in a direction that matters because we have confidence that we're going to build the thing. And we have a, a roadmap of here's the things we need to build in what order to be able to be the most effective. And we know by virtue of doing these calls who our Beachhead customers are, who are the ones that are going to you know, listen to us first, that would actually go through and take a chance on us and develop that go-to-market plan. This is the part that gets scary. It's turn some people off. How long is it? It's about 60 days typically, I, I'd say, 60 to 90 days. The first 10 to 20% of that time spent on the market fundamental side of things. And then if we pass that gate, we're still excited about this, then we move into the customer interviews. And that's you know, 80 to 90% of our time uh, spent doing that. And at the end of this process, we hope we get to answer this question. Is this the right opportunity? So, any questions at this point? Yes, ma'am. So, you currently have customers using, you have a freemium model, customers are currently using the product. How long have you been around? And how, how, how in contact are you with your customers right now? Do you have, okay. Um, that, that can be a tricky thing to get out of because we now peg the value at zero for some folks. But, have, and we'll get into this a little more detail in a, in a moment, but going through and um, asking in-depth questions, diving into like where the real value is. And, and this gets into a bit of like the segmentation of the product itself. Can we go through and create a freemium model to where here are the features we carve out to where here you can try it, use it, you get this level of functionality, and now, and now we're getting into these other levels. So it's a bit of a product management um, type question, but it goes, goes into the heart of you know, diving in a bit more into you know, what those relationships are with the customers. And that, if you don't mind, I'll circle back a little bit back to that. So how many customers do you think we should interview? That, that's, that's a good answer. But what would be your minimum? What's the minimum number you think we should, we should talk to? Would you say? OK. Any other guesses? All right. Let's take one more guess. That's a really good, that's a really good point. If I had to put a number on it, I would say 100. And, and I would really, really enforce it's 100. And, and I think this is a really powerful statement. So this, this guy, 10 customer interviews are worth 1,000 surveys. And that's Ian McCabe. He, he has a company called Intercom. And the, the great thing about this is, does anybody know what Intercom does? Anybody familiar with them? They gather customer feedback. The guy that built an app to collect customer feedback so, you know, I, in our case, you know, it was a minimum of 100 direct interviews, 100 different people, and that's, that's not counting repeat conversations we had with them. And what I, I generally recommend is, is starting with over the phone. I, I really recommend doing the face-to-face -face stuff if you can. Um, you can kind of warm up, you know, doing the phone interviews to begin with. Um, a lot of people say, well, I'll just do a quick hit and do the surveys. Survey monkey. Great. What questions are you going to ask? How do you like your product? Is scale of one to 10. Do you use this competitor, yes or no? Well, that's easy enough, yes, no. But are they going, yes, and they're awesome? Are they going, ah, yes, and they suck. I can't wait to get rid of them. You don't know. You don't, that doesn't come across in a survey. And, and going through this process, surveys I'm not against. I'm just, I'm, I'm not a big fan of them at the beginning because we don't know what the questions are to ask and how to, to manipulate and, and, and phrase those questions to get the most information. Because a survey is validation. Interviewing is going through and, and trying to prove out a thesis. Like, is, is, this, is there a problem here? And what are, what's, what are the threads of that problem? How far does it go? And which areas do you want to push on? The other piece is body language. I can't tell you how many times that we would be in an interview. Um, there was a customer once that uh, sat down with us like, look, I don't want to waste you guys' time, but scholarships aren't an issue for us. We, we kind of knock them out in two weeks and we're done. Great. I'd love it if I can talk to you because you could you know, teach me something. I'd love to share it back with some of the other people we're talking with. Can you tell me, you know, what happens if you have to change the details of a scholarship? Oh, we, we give it to the DBA. Oh, okay, so, so he, this is his primary job? No. Have you ever had any typos in it? Yeah, so he has to change this too? Yeah. How long does that take? Oh, God. It, sometimes like two weeks. And you know, has he ever screwed up? Oh, he took the whole site down. Next thing you know, that two week problem, that's a 12 month problem. I mean, we start at, I, but I knew those questions. I knew how to press on them because I had done all these other interviews. I knew where the areas were. And it's not me going and telling somebody their business. I'm just going through and asking questions. And I'm, I'm having you think about the problem 
and then telegraphing. And, then, and if I had just done that in a survey, I would have never gotten it. But I actually got to see this guy slump over and grunt and then go, like, Do you, are you guys doing anything in this? Why, why yes, yeah, so we're actually working in this area. I'd love to, to show you what we have. Uh, I recommend writing out the questions beforehand, and that'll change. But write it down the first time around. They're going to be basic. It's okay. But then, you know, you can, you can work and manipulate them as you go along. Uh, a couple other tricks. Record the interviews. I'm going to hate hearing my voice on this thing. Uh, but I'm going to go back and rewatch it and see how I, I could be better. Same thing on those, those interviews as well. Because there may be things you're thinking so much about the questions you're asking, there may be things that you're missing. You can have a friend or your partner come and, and observe the interview. That's helpful as well. Because now that person is sitting across and watching for cues that you may be missing because you're thinking about what that next question is, trying to keep the conversation going. And I kind of think of it like journalism. You think about Anderson Cooper, the great, great interviewer. But it's not just him. If you look, when the camera pans back, he asks a question, and then he turns around, he's looking at his next question. He's kind of listening to what the, the person is saying, but he's queuing up that next question. And there's producers in his ear going, wait, go back, press on that. That guy flinched, his lip quivered, he's starting to sweat. That, those are the types of cues that somebody else is going to pick up on that you're going you're gonna to possibly miss. And if you're with the customer and face-to-face, -face, feel free to ask them, like, do you mind? I, I really want to pay attention to our conversation. Do you mind if I record this so I can take notes later? And more times than not, people are going to be okay with that. Um, and, and approach this, um, this process with just being generally curious. Like, go in there acting like you know nothing. Tell me about what you do. I'd love to hear about it. And more, more times than not, people open up and you'll hear things that you never, never expected. Yes. This is exactly how I'd set up. Hi, my name is Matt Thomas. I'm calling from a company called Academic Works. I was wondering if I could take a few minutes of your time. I'm doing research about how colleges and universities manage their scholarship programs. Could, could you lend me a little bit of your time just to tell me what you guys do? Oh, are you trying to sell something? We're, we're not interested. Nope. I don't even have anything to sell. No product. I'm just doing real research just to learn what you do. Do you have any time? And that's it. More times than not, people will say yes or can you call me back later? Is there a better time? Exactly. Exactly. And you know, can I just, I just need 15 minutes of your time. And, and that's not a bad amount of time for somebody to give up. And that conversation may go long. Let it. Now that person's signaling that th this is something of interest to them. And I usually just time box to try to get initial 10 questions. Yes. That's a great point. Great point. Um, always say thank you. Always express appreciation, even if the interview was worthless. Thank you so much. This was really helpful. I learned a lot. Nobody ever says thank you. Nobody ever says what you said to me mattered. Nobody says, man, I learned a lot from you today, and this has been super helpful. And whether it was, it was helpful or not, that, that person could be opening a door for you later on. And then three closing questions. This is what, uh, if you take away anything, this is the thing that I, this has helped us the most um, in, in our experience. So thank you very much. This, I really appreciate this. This has been super helpful. I've learned a ton from you. Are there any other people you recommend I speak with? Is there anybody else that you think you know, knows as much about this subject as you do that could be helpful and provide some insight? That person may give you a name or two. And this goes back to like, you know, I don't know who to call. I don't know where to start. You start with one person. All you need to do is find one. And that person gives you two, three names. Now when I call, it's like, hey, I talked to Jane. Hi, my name is Matt Thomas. I'm calling from Academic Works. I'm doing research on scholarship management. Jane over at the University of Austin said that I should talk with you and that you know a lot about this. Do you have 15 minutes? Now I got my foot in the door. Email, same way. This person, you know, I'll do that name drop. Ask that same question. Now that one person turns to two, turns, and it just grows exponentially. Where do you go to learn about this subject? Like how, do you, how do you keep up to date? Are there any conferences you're going to, meetups, whatnot? This was crucial for us. National Scholarship Providers Association, a ADRP, Association of Donor Relations Professionals, NASA, National Association of Scholarship and Financial Aid Administrators. I can give you all kinds of other acronyms that all came about through doing those calls. And this is also where we know, you know, th this also gives us a measure of like how networked the group is. And we can go to this conference and do a quick hit and meet all these people at once as opposed to having to do one by one. And then last, would you mind if, you know, again, this has been really helpful, would you mind if I follow up with you in a few weeks um, as I learn more about this to ask you a few more in-depth questions or to get your thoughts on some of the things I've learned? Because again, what I'm telegraphing is, You've been super helpful, and I've learned so much, and I wish I could learn more from you, and I'm just kind of you know, starting out. And the, what this is actually doing is that person is probably going to say yes, and you're developing a relationship. 
And now over time, this person's gonna build trust with you. And what you start off is like I'm testing an idea, and by the end, this person is somebody you're calling up to, to validate your idea. And you're actually showing mock-ups to, and then becomes potentially that first beachhead customer. Because you're not building something that's in your head. You're building the thing that they told you was a problem. You're building a thing that they told you what the solution was, and they validated it. Nobody ever comes up and calls you and says, thanks, that was really helpful. Wow, you taught me a lot about this. You have such good ideas. I'm gonna implement the thing that you told me to do. I'm gonna go and buy this now. That person now is gonna go take it to their manager because like, look, it's not this, this guy called me to sell me this thing. This guy listened to me, this guy listened to my problem, and this guy actually went through and, and so much he listened, he thought I had great ideas and he implemented, I think we should buy this thing that I made. But I'm not selling anything, I'm just, I'm, I'm providing the thing, their dream, the thing that they made. A uh, Couple other things here, practice disassociation. And what I mean about that is that especially in the early days of, of doing these interviews, some of the questions can come off as, as, as accusatory, right? Do you have problems with your thank you letters? Do your students not provide thank you letters? Why don't you collect thank you letters? Why don't you, you have a problem. I know where the bodies are buried, tell me about it. That, you know, people, I just met you, I don't wanna you know, say that I have problems or that our process is it good or maybe I'm not, you know, somebody's gonna say I'm not doing my job. So if we frame it a little bit differently, I talked to a lot of other people they said that collecting thank you letters can be a real challenge for them. Do you, what do you think about that? Is that a, do you guys share that challenge? Do you share that experience? And what we've done instead of me saying, you have a problem, right here, you have, I know you do, tell me about it, tell me about the problem. We're saying, I've talked to other people and it's okay. And they, they said that they have this problem up here. What do you think about this? Do you, do you think this is a bad problem? Do you share that experience? And what you'll find is that people will generally open up. Because now I'm not accusing them. They're now, now you're a therapist, you're sharing. And that, that, that can move the needle uh, quite a bit. And then on the other side is, is you're testing the product itself. And this, I think, can go a bit, ma'am, to your, your question uh, about testing the freemium model, is that uh, not, y y nobody's gonna tell you your baby's ugly, right? So I come in and I'm like, hey, what do you think? Hey, do you like my jacket? I just bought it. Is it nice? Like how, and she's like, yeah, yeah. She's like, it looks like crap. That's the worst jacket ever. Like, I hear patterns are in, yeah? Probably not, I don't know. But everybody here is gonna say yes, right? But if, if we frame it differently to where, you know, what do you think about this thing I built and we turn it into, you mentioned that this was an issue for you. You know, I've talked to other people and they share that and they, they really, they, some of those folks have given us this idea. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a good way of solving this? What is your opinion about it? So you know, we've kind of set it off to the side. Now we're just kind of both looking at this thing. And you don't know if it's my, I didn't say it was mine. It's not my solution. It's not my product, not my feature. This is the problem that you told me about and your peers told me about. And this is a solution that you all came up with and I'm trying to see, did, that, did I hear you correctly? What do you guys think about this? And generally people are more open to, to provide real feedback there. And then this becomes, I think, our, our competitive advantage. And the reason is, it. This is not just used for us, it was not just used as this discrete thing to, to vet out opportunities, it was. But this actually became the, part of the DNA of our organization, it became part of our product management process. So when we were testing other ideas, other products, we were going through a version of this. So we discovered that there was a donor portal, an idea for donors to log in and actually not just collect a thank you letter once a year in a hard copy, but actually have ongoing updates from students about their internships and their thank you letters, and what they're working on, and how they're doing in class. When we first pitched that idea, customers were like, oh, that's great, that's great, in 10 to 15 years, because you know, our donors, are, they're, they, don't like, they don't like the internets, so they don't like the inner tubes, uh, they, don't, they don't get on that, they, you know, no thank you. What we found, as we kept going through and digging further, the idea was actually sound, as our positioning was wrong. They were thinking this is, we have to swap this for what they do today. And we went through and repositioned it as, hey, we have this donor portal, and it's another tool in your tool belt. You have your letters, you have these other methods of communications, your luncheons, and so on, and you have this. Oh, wow. So now that person that likes to sit at their iPad and drink coffee at Starbucks and go through and show off all the students they're helping out and get other people to donate to that fund. That got people really excited. So, am I just talking about this stuff in retrospective? Did I read some book, and I'm just trying to spot it out? Yes, we actually really did do this. Over the course of six months, we started the company, we say officially July 1 of 2010. That's how many ideas we worked through in, in, in six months. 
You'll notice one of them's up there twice. So college application software. I barked up this tree. You probably figured out a better way of doing it. We went down that and we looked at the initial market. And you're like, eh, doesn't work for us. Scholarship management, too many competitors. We're looking for Blue Ocean, which now I don't believe in Blue Ocean. There's always an alternative. There's always a substitute. There's always a competitor. I have to convince you to change from what you're doing. But I learned that after the fact. So we bailed on that. IT risk management, law citation. My business partner's a lawyer. He hated the idea, uh, but he entertained it for a couple weeks anyway. Uh, but the, just the market wasn't there. Going down to faculty accreditation, that's actually one we spent two months on. So you remember earlier I said, you know, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. We went through and spent full 60 days looking into this problem. And then we got a call from this little company called Thomson Reuters, the $7 billion little boutique company. They said, hey, we hear you guys are interested in this area. We've been looking at it too. We want to see if we can share notes. Like, sure. So there's already an established competitor. Thomson Reuters calls up. They've been working on this for 12 months, spent a million dollars. We looked at it. We, we were in a rat infested office on the east side uh, and had no money. And we were looking at, we can maybe take on this established competitor, but now getting squeezed between somebody that's already burned 12 months and a million dollars, and this established competitor, we had to say no. So we took a step back, we were really excited, we put all this work into this, but we looked at the opportunity and said, you know what, it's not the right opportunity, we're gonna have to say no. We backed off of it. But, and it, that would have been so much harder if we had actually built the thing. If we had built it first and then started testing it, we would have lapped on, we would have been at this for 12, 18 months. We may have burned out and never been there. But it moved us back to going looking at scholarship management again. We dug through and went through, and we, as we got into it, that turned into that iceberg for us. So getting close to wrapping up here, the, just to give you an idea of the, kind of where things ended up, on the left-hand side, this is kind of just a quick timeline. So we started in July of 2010, incorporated in, in, in December of 2010, meaning the four of us got together and actually formed the company. We hired a first engineer. And in the first 12 months, we got 30 customers. That meant $340,000 in bookings. Wasn't too bad. We never raised outside capital, ever. Uh, and we sold it ultimately for $50 million to, to BlackBot. And that was cash, no strings attached. And if we listened to, to everybody just on the outside, college universities are disappearing. Worthless market. Schools are moving to full tuition waivers. No need for scholarships. Bell cycle's too long. I love that one. I, I really do like that. For me, that's a wall. Keeps you guys out. Market is too small. The reason I go back to that, especially on that last one, is like there's some niche problems that people overlook because of these other things. But when we dig in, if you look on the right hand side, we had over 500 customers when we sold, 98% renewal rate. We were an annuity. So if I signed you up, you didn't leave. Your checks kept coming. On top of that, your rate increased usually 5% on average a year and it, you just passed it through. They didn't have to fight with you on it. 83 cents of every dollar that came in the door went to the bottom line. We had 99 uh, net, promoter, net promoter score. Everybody loved us. And the thing I'm most proud of at the end is that the real change we affected. We ended up helping facilitate $660 million in 2017. Uh, and act, sorry, actually that's from 2016. Uh, dollars awarded when there are schools that only use 70% of their funds. So I'm getting close on, on time here. There's a couple of things I wanted to, to highlight as far as uh, material. Um, these are you know, a, couple, a couple of these are articles. The top one is a book. There's a guy here on campus, Dr. Rob Adams, uh, who wrote a book called If You Build It, Will They Come? If you take one thing away from this, read that book. And if you're going to stop short, just read the first 100 pages. But arguably, he does a better job explaining this than I did. His book, ironically, came out uh, as we were going through this. I'd read his previous book, A Good Hard Kick in the Ass, and there's a small section that kind of uh, is, covers a similar topic. But uh, you know, this is, if, if I were to just give one piece of advice, if you were to take away anything, it'd be go read that book. It's, a, it can, uh, it, it's not gonna be the thing where you're like, oh, I can't wait to find out what happens in the next chapter, but it is the playbook of how to go about these things. Um, so, you always got to close with a quote, right? So opportunity is missed by people, by most people, because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. So I would still argue that that work you're putting up front, that 60 days, and we, we spent six months, seven ideas, but it turned out for the best. We actually were able to go through and displace um, 
a competitor, or there were actually four competitors. Our, out of our first 10 customers, three of them came from competitors, from two separate competitors. Our 13th customer came from the largest competitor, and it was their largest customer, University of North Texas. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if we had not done the legwork up front. To go through, we can't go, you know, we didn't go through and say, like, here's these four competitors. What are all their features? We're going to do that plus one. And it was going through and figuring out, okay, we have minimal resources. What's the minimum that we can do to say we play the game? And what's one or two things that's going to change somebody's perspective and get them to take a chance and move over to us? And that's how, we, if we had not gone through this process, we would have, we would have been in a room looking for a light switch with a light on. And this is the way that we, we kind of came, uh, got through that process and ended up, you know, having uh, what we, we felt was a, success, a successful result at the end. So I've been rambling on. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out and especially during lunch. Um, but you guys have any questions or anything I can ex expand on? And yeah, it's a great point. And that's where going through and doing this process, we, ha we had such a, I can tell you everything about this market. I can tell you, you know, who the different players are, the competitors, who all is involved, and why this is going to work. And I can say that with so much confidence because I've done all these calls. I can point back to all the research I've done. And if we were to go and raise money and, we, and, and, and do something like that, and where I've seen that work is where somebody, that, you could look at the other ways. Those competitors actually have, have validated there is a market, and then here's the opportunity. This is why they're not growing. This is why they're not going into larger institutions. And here's our way to get in the door. And here are our target customers. We started with 4,000. We whittled down to 22 of a target market. Here are the 100 we're targeting there and be our beachhead customers. And this is how we're going to parlay them into, and move upstream from there. Um, and so it's, it comes into the strategy and that's all backed up by the data and the interviews that we've done. We could actually go through and, you know, hey, it's Velda at Auburn said that this is an issue. And Clifton at University, or Texas A&M, Central Texas. You know, I, you know, we can point to those individuals. T taking diligent, diligent notes. Uh, we, we wrote everything down, we take, you know, anytime there was a call, we would go back through and, and um, you know, once a week, my, there was one partner that I worked closely with at the beginning uh, that we were doing these interviews, and we would typically, at the end of the week, go through and kind of circle back and digest. What, who did you talk to? What did you see? What are the trends that we're, we're seeing? What, and then, how do we need to change our questions? How do we need to re refocus this? Because uh, one thing I didn't, I didn't go through is that um, I didn't know anything about scholarships. I guarantee you, you all in this room know more about scholarships than I did when I started out. And my first call was literally, hi, my name is Matt Thomas, the whole preamble I told you earlier. What can you, uh, I'm calling, can you tell me about your scholarship process? Sure, what do you want to know? I want to know how you take the money and you give it to the kids so they can go to school. Yeah, well, which kind of scholarships? The ones that pay for class. Well, are you talking about endowed funds, restricted funds, uh, presidential scholarship, fund swapping? I don't know what those words mean. Slow down. Write them down. Tell me more about that. That was, I'm not kidding you, that was almost verbatim the first call I had. And that woman was very kind, took her time to me. I could tell she was like, this guy's an idiot. Four weeks later, because remember, I asked her if I could call her back. Four weeks later, I called her back. And we had a more in-depth conversation. At the end of that call, she said, have you worked in financial aid? No, why do you ask? You, just, you know so much about it. She totally forgot that that idiot called her four weeks ago. And she thought that I knew so much about it because I had already done, you know, whatever, 50 calls over that, that period of time. And so those initial questions, they're very broad and, you know, kind of open-ended. Tell me about this. How do you feel about this? And then, then we start getting into the targeted piece. And that actually ends up becoming part of our positioning and our sales process. When we would sell, we wouldn't walk into a room and say, like, hey, you have scholarships? Hey, you need our software. We have, we have scholarship software. It's like, hey, do you, do you give away scholarships? How much do you give away a year? What is that process like? What are you doing today? Are you managing a spreadsheet? Are you using this competitor? And we know what the, the weak points are in the competitor. Do they offer authentication? Oh, they don't? Okay, is that a challenge? Do you have multiple apps? Da, 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 da. Now we get through it and that person's slumped over. Oh my God, this is, I thought this thing was working. Do you have something that's better? Oh yeah, yeah, we actually, we're working on something. Here it is, if you'd like to see it. So is this, now those questions where I'm trying to figure out if they're an opportunity, the best questions are now turning into this is how I'm going to go through and position. I'm going to get it in your head that you actually have a problem just by asking you questions. So uh, again, I really appreciate you guys' this time. Um, feel free to contact me. I, I love talking about this stuff. It's a really, um, I love this topic. Uh, it's a really broad one. We can go really deep, and I'm more than happy to, 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 to do that. Uh, if it's not a waste of your, of your time, if you have any specific questions, you know, reach out to me or I'll, I'll stick around. Um, but again, I, I really appreciate it and I hope this has been helpful. Um, 
And if there, you guys have any feedback, positive or ne negative, um, please let me know or let the folks at uh, Herb Keller Senator know, um, you know ways I can make this better. Um, this is my, I'm used to having this conversation on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so any feedback you have on how to make this more poignant, there are parts that didn't make sense, parts to drop, don't wear patterns, all of that is fair game. All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>